Does God exist? Does God still interact with us today? Here's the good news. God is alive and showing up in people's lives today in the 21st century. These are the stories of how he reveals himself and is working in the lives of real people through the miracles, the mayhem, and the mundane of life. Hello and welcome. I am Hollis Moore. And I am Lori Spiker. We are two friends whose faith journeys have become intertwined as we felt called to share God with the world in a unique and different way. So here's our podcast. By sharing people's stories, we transform how we relate to each other and how we relate to God. Be prepared to experience the unconditional love of God in new and unexpected ways. And be prepared to proclaim, Oh My God is Awesome. Welcome to the Oh My God Pod. Hi guys, it's Hollis. Thanks for joining us on the special episode of the Oh My God Pod. This is not your typical episode. As I sat down on August 24th via Zoom to interview missionary pastor Paul Traver from Germany, what emerged in our conversation from the Oh My God is Awesome membership interview became something that I had to share with you all. Paul works as a pastor in Kaiserslautern, Germany. This is one of the largest military bases outside of the United States. Right now, they are assisting with efforts with Afghan evacuees. And Paul and his church are boots on the ground, helping people find some sort of stability and sharing the love of Christ as they're leaving a horrible, horrible situation and fleeing their homeland. Again, this is not your typical interview, but because of the timeliness of this current event and the amazing opportunity that we had to get a perspective from Paul, I encourage you to listen to this 45 minute episode that is definitely going to be a part of history. Thanks for joining us again. Hi everybody, it's Hollis Moore, your founder of the Oh My God is Awesome monthly membership and with me is one of our monthly contributors, Paul Traver. And Paul is uh, coming to us from Kaiserslautern, Germany. And so we are right at the point in history where um, within the last week, two weeks, the Taliban has um, kind of infiltrated lots of cities in Afghanistan. And Paul can kind of share what he's experiencing as being the largest in a town that has the largest military population of Americans and what they're doing to support the refugee effort. So while this is a little bit of a deviation from our membership, I know that God is going to be revealing himself through our conversation. But Paul, uh, today it's August 24th, 2021. And can you tell us a little bit about what's happening on um, the base there and with your particular ministry? Yeah, that. thank you, Hollis, and welcome, everybody. It's good to be with you. Yeah, basically, when Kabul was surrounded and overtaken, they had to start doing the evacuations for all of the Afghan nationals who had been helping with the military, as well as internationals who were in Kabul. And so they evacuated them here to Ramstein Air Force Base. It's been kind of crazy this last week since about Thursday of last week to this point. Pretty crazy with planes coming in and out and refugee. No, they're not refugees. We're classifying them as evacuees right now. But as evacuees, they're being brought here and then they're able to be cared for medically, making sure they're taken care of and as far as getting all their paperwork uh, taken care of and and stuff. So they're, they're processing them. Sadly, my wife and I have not had access to them because it's, it's kind of a cl- action right now because they want to limit as many people um, that are not in the active duty military. They want to limit as many people as getting in there. And, and, and I say that only because they're, what they don't want to do is they don't want to cross the religious, the religious boundaries because, you know, you have your Muslim and you have your Christians, if you will. <clears throat> and if you're an overzealous Christian, you could be there for the wrong reason. Even though the gospel is important, we all know everyone needs to hear the gospel. But we also know 
that every time Jesus sat down with someone, he didn't necessarily go straight to the gospel. He was the light. He met them where they were. He loved them. He earned the right to speak into their life. And so this is, this was a, this is an important balance for us. So I said all that to say this, that, that they've limited how many can actually be on base. So we weren't able to actually be there, but our people are. And so we have a church here in Kaiserslautern, Germany. It's been here for over 50 years. We've been the pastors for four years. And so we have military that are in our, our church family that are now being called to meet this need. And, and, and they're working anywhere from 10 to 16 hours a day to meet this need. And they've shifted everybody. Some of them are used to working, you know, a nine hour, eight hour shift during the day are now working night shifts. So they're from, you know, from 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. or what have you. Um, so they're, they're, they're getting stretched out pretty tight. So, yeah. And, and what are the members of your church who are active duty, serving on the base? What type of things are they doing with the, uh, oh, yeah, that's the, good. the that's Afghan good. people? Yeah, that's good. We, we have, we have some in our church that are logistics, some that are medical, some that are officers. And so I don't quite know what they're doing uh, on the, on the small details. I just know over, overall they're working in those fields. So the medical side would be, you know, some of the folks have come and especially the women fighting to get onto the plane may have been elbowed or, or punched or whipped or what have you. And, and not by the, those with them, but, you know, with the Taliban as they're trying to work through barricades and stuff, and then just the crowd in general. And so when they're getting here, you know, they're, they're bruised and beaten. And, and of course, then you're talking about emotionally upset. So all of that being said, the medical side is making sure that they're 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 taken care of. They're they're there's no broken bones or any any lacerations that are open. You know things like that. And then of course the logistics side, getting all the. I think I read today that there are over 400, 400 portable toilets. Now I know that's not something we probably want to talk about on a podcast, but four hundred portable toilets for oh what was it seven thousand people something like that, and. Three to four times a day, these toilets are having to be serviced. So we're talking empty, restocked, and four times a day. That is a lot of toilet use. And so that's one side of the logistics. But then you have the food side. And I, I saw a stat here oh, just recently, but we're talking thousands of meals every single day. So you figure five, six, seven thousand, seven thousand people times three meals a day. That's 21,000 meals every single day. So there's lots happening on the base where, you know, they're just trying to get cots set up, to have tents set up, make sure everybody's sleeping, make sure, you know. And then on top of that, you have these folks that are coming from the middle of the desert, um, used to a different climate, and they come here and it's cooler. We're on the 30, we're above the 39th parallel. So, you know, it's, I'm wearing a hoodie. And we're in August. So yeah, it's, so it's a different, different mindset. Wow. There's so much to unpack there. I, uh, I know before we started recording, you had a couple anecdotes to medical. There yeah. were some births on the actual yeah. evacuated airplanes. Can you just share yeah, yeah. that story with us? Well, the, the one story just broke recently, but when we got it, it hadn't come out public and, and it was about one particular young lady. I, again, I don't know who she was. I don't know how old she was. It doesn't matter. But she was on the plane and mid flight, she began, it, she went into labor pains. And so I, I don't know if the baby was premature. I don't think so. But you can imagine the stress and strain of getting on the flight, all the emotions, all that was going on. And that lent to this birth. And so it was really cool. The story tells it that the pilot actually descended to below 12,500 feet so that the um, child and the mother could, could be in an oxygen rich environment, I guess, if you will. And so it, it, it all turned out well, they landed mom and the baby were taken to the hospital and, and the hospital is a, is a, an American um, military hospital. So they're taken to the hospital, they're checked out, they're made sure that they're good. And, 
And so the reports we've gotten, everything turned out well, but that was just one. And, and I've heard that there were a couple more, but that was one in particular. Wow. That's, that's wild. Having given birth twice, it's a very <laughs> crazy experience, but to yeah. be giving birth in an airplane as you're evacuating your home country is, is yeah, yeah. wild. And then one of the things talking about logistics, you've received tons of donations and a lot of that has been clothing mm-hmm. and shoes. And tell us a little bit about what that distribution has been oh, like. Oh man, that has been nuts. Of course, the call went out for help. And it, and, and only because everybody was caught off guard with this whole thing. And so the, the Ramstein community, particularly the Air Force Base, just sent out the call for everybody to respond. Well, we, of course, as a church, we're collecting things. And where I'm at right now, I'm at Rama Cafe, which is the Kaiser Slautern Military Resiliency Center. And, and we, we serve the military here active duty and retired. So they became, what was really cool is they have a relationship with the leadership on base of which we as a church wouldn't. So Rama became our gateway to getting things on base. So we would bring it here to Rama and they're picked, they pick it up. People on base come over here to pick it up and take it. And from what I understand, it was three or four times a day. There were three or four vehicles a day. So so imagine what would that be? That would be three, six, nine, 12. So 12 vehicles each day coming, picking stuff up and loading it, not just one or two items, but literally loading the vehicle to its extent, vans, cars, whatever, and then taking that on. They were receiving so many clothing, not just from us, but from around the area, so much clothing and supplies. They didn't have enough sorters to go through it. So they had to shut the the amount of, they just shut down the, the donations coming in. That doesn't mean they shut down the donations. They just shut down it arriving so, so they could catch up and not tax their people. We in turn also were connected with a sister church, which of course were Assemblies of God. And so our uh, a sister Assemblies of God church in Heidelberg, which is about an hour from here, heard about what was happening. And they called their church and their church responded and they drove up with a van full of stuff and we were able to deliver it. And then on top of that, we've had financial offerings. So we've had people giving, donating. And what we're looking to do now is when the call comes out to either go purchase more items and that could be stuffed toys. It could be hygiene items, which we also have to be careful that we're culturally sensitive with that as well. You know, for instance, a Muslim man isn't going to want Axe body spray. (laughs) So we, we have to be very careful how we do that. And so we'll probably go out and purchase those items and then make them all available for everybody. So. Well, and, and to your point too, being respectful of cultural differences, there are certain items of clothing that are very normal for, for us in Western culture that yeah. are not appropriate. Can you tell us a yeah. little bit about that? Yeah. Interestingly enough, when, when you're talking about someone, whether, whether Muslim or not, but coming from Muslim countries, there's, there's certain cultural things that we're not used to. I had, I had a, a missionary recently tell me who has worked with this particular people group that shared a story of an encounter, an interesting encounter where a, a, a particular mother, uh, sorry, father, daughter, were going to ride a city bus. I can't tell you what city it is in and that's doesn't matter, but it was here in Europe and they were going to ride this city bus and this Muslim man had seen this daughter. Now we're not talking little girl. We're talking, you know, an older daughter and she had almost sleeveless top on. And, and so this missionary told me that, that this Muslim man mistook her for a prostitute because the culture he came from, especially Afghani culture, the culture he came from when a woman would wear either a super short sleeve or no sleeve top, whether it's a dress or a sweater or what have you. Well, I don't think a sweater would be sleeveless, but still in that situation that communicates that she's a prostitute. So he walked up to this father daughter and went to hand the man money because he was going to take the daughter home. And the guy got beat up. Sadly, he got beat up, but he was wondering why he got beat up because in his culture, that was just what you did. And so he was kind of shocked when he found that out. So 
that's that's part of this stuff we gotta we gotta it, it doesn't mean they're broken it doesn't mean they're upside down because sometimes we americans seem to think that we have the perfect picture of how everybody should be living and 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 we're not it just helps us to be able to understand there are people out there that are just a little different than us and we need to be patient with them we need to understand where they're coming from and not try and convert them uh too quickly so mm, interesting and then i i would imagine when you're sorting through those clothes what you would be offering to women who are coming from afghanistan without offending them Here's your tank yep. top. Oh, sorry. Yes. That's probably not what yes. you would choose for yourself. That's really interesting Absolutely. as I sit here, you know, on a 90 degree day in Colorado where, you know, yep. athletic wear is very popular and right, we don't right. think anything of it. But nope. to your point about this man, like coming from the culture that he was in, he wasn't doing anything out of the ordinary from where he came from by yep. initiating that transaction. Yeah. Wow. So I know you're kind of really in the thick of it right now, but where do you see you and your church family having the most impact with the, and I know you didn't call them refugees, but what is the term that right. we're using? Evacuees. Evacuees. Where do you feel your church can impact these evacuees the most right now? Oh man. Uh, well, I wish we could impact them on a greater level, to be honest. But with the limitations that we have, what we are endeavoring to do is just simply try to be for our people, a home, a place of rest, because, you know, again, you know, talking to some of our folks in our church, they are absolutely maxed out. And so whatever we can do to help them so they can continue the continue the race, if you will, is an important part of what we want to do. We'll stay, we'll stay doing what we're doing. We'll be a hub for gathering items and getting them on base and doing everything we can to raise finances and whatever is needed. But I can assure you, if they open the door for us to go in there and physically get involved, we would do it in a second. But for now, until that happens, we're going to be happy just to do whatever we can to help those on the front line. Okay. And, you know, we didn't talk about this at the top of the discussion here, but the people that you're, that are in Ramstein are evacuees of Afghan descent primarily. Are yeah. you guys in your community, are, are you receiving servicemen or are you receiving Americans? I would imagine they're probably on some of those planes, but I can't tell you who, because they won't break that down and give us numbers. And I think that's probably a good idea because people can blow some of that stuff, the PR stuff way overboard. And so we're not, I don't know. And, and it could be, there could be internationals, meaning, you know, folks from the Netherlands or Mexico or Antarctica, you know, <laughs> I don't know, but I, I think a good majority of them are, are refugees, not refugees, evacuees that are Afghani. But as you know, Kabul, Kabul was a, is a large, large city. And so there's universities there. There's all kinds of international workers. So who knows um, where they all belong and where they're trying to get home to. Okay. Yeah. I just, I know there's a, the question on the table just in general is, are we getting our Americans out of there? Well, I, I, I could share my opinion on that. And, and as you know, I'm not very excited with the recent news that this, I, I don't know where many of the viewers political stance are, and that's why I, I want to try and avoid that. But the, the reality is, is we've been let down by this leader that we have. And, and I, I think it's safe to say that what it, it wasn't done correctly. And as, 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 as that being the case, there've been individuals who are Americans and we know it. I mean, you can look in the news and you can see them, you know, they, there's stories out there. You can, you can find them individuals, whether it's one or many that are now left outside the airport because they can't get to the airport. Something that many people don't know that the American news is not covering. What is what has happened is is that the the, Af, the the Taliban. Now we're not talking about just the Taliban. Okay, so let's back up for a moment. When the Taliban came in and and started moving forward, taking parts of the country, there were two major air force base. Well, not wait. Let me back up. There were two major airports near each other. One was Kabul, where they are now, and the other one was Bagram. Bagram Air Force Base was just a short distance from Kabul. It was a defensive position. It handled 
three times the amount of flights every day that Kabul airport or Hamid Karzai airport handled on a daily basis. So in, in the president's plan to get everything out for some strange reason, why I have no idea, but he closed Bagram air force base at, at before he closed any, uh, before he closed Kabul. So what ended up happening is you had our military going to an international airport that was not defensively set up and expected to hold it. So as Bagram fell at Bagram, there was a prison in that prison. There was Al Qaeda, Taliban and ISIS. And so as they broke the Taliban outs, I don't know the exact story and how it unfolded. But what I heard is there was infighting taking place and a turf war. And now ISIS is out. So they're out. So now the story is that not only has the Taliban surrounded the airport, but ISIS has infiltrated that and Al Qaeda has infiltrated that and they've created a multi-layer roadblock process. So if someone comes into the airport to get to the airport, they've got to go through multiple checkpoints and each checkpoint is, is thoroughly looking them over and making sure that everything's square. And they're specifically looking for foreign workers, people who help the U S or any of the NATO countries and then Americans. And so if they find them, who knows what happens? So you can see the complexity of this. And now these these Americans, wherever they are in the country, there's pockets of them that are now stranded. I just heard yesterday that the yesterday day that the either the British or the Americans went out and rescued a hundred and some odd citizens from somewhere. And you just go, why? I mean, this should have never happened. So now, now I'm getting into the political side, so I don't want to go there. <laughs> no, and it is so it's, it, it is super touchy because we do want to focus yeah. on God. But you had mentioned that there was a decision that came down about rescuing yeah, our yeah. Americans. I, I haven't heard that. So would you just state the fact of what was <clears throat> given by our federal government? Well, what was what was on the table in the original plan was is that September 11th of 2022, no, 2021, sorry, September 11th, 2021 was the end date for all the Americans to be out of the country. And, and so the, when all of this, everything started collapsing as it did in the last week, since this whole thing, when Kabul got surrounded and the whole thing, the president was asking if if they could extend past August 31st. So now we know the September 11th date is a wash. It's out. It's not going to happen now because of where we are at this moment. So he asked if the evacuation timeline can be extended past October or, or August 31st. And so he was in negotiations, I guess, with the G7 and with Taliban. And basically the Taliban said, no, if you go past August 31st, we're going to end up in a fight. And so the decision I saw tonight on a European station, I didn't check the others, but the European station said that Biden has, has basically said that they will not extend the deadline past August 31st. And so that, that means that if these individuals can't get to the airport by August 31st, they're not getting out. So there, we've already heard that there's ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Taliban, who have set up checkpoints around the airport prohibiting pro-American, pro-Afghan, anybody that's helped, any NATO, yeah. Yeah. and individual American citizens are expected to fight their way through or sneak their way through these checkpoints mm -hmm. to get to the airport on their own with no escort services from our government or our military. And it's just, uh, if you can right. get there, great, we'll get you out. Otherwise, Good luck. You're on your own and you're stranded in a foreign country. Yeah, basically. Wow. Yeah. I, I I've never, I've never in my life, if my, <laughs> if my father was alive today, of course, he's a 27 year army veteran, a special forces. If he was alive today, he would be, he would be livid because that is not something that when you're in the military, you do, you never 
ever leave anyone behind. Even if they're dead, you don't leave them behind. And, and so you bring them home. And it is, it is absolutely, I, I'm astonished. I am absolutely astonished that we would even be having this discussion, even if for one American, it doesn't make any sense. So, so yes, my heart is breaking uh, for so many reasons. But if we bring this around to our Father, our God, our Lord, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and just to kind of take the jumping off point of how you were a contributor in the Oh My God is Awesome membership, which specifically looks at the characteristics, the attributes, the the personhood of God. You chose to talk about three things that I think are really important in in this conversation. So one of them was from Psalm 23, verse one, our shepherd. God is described in Psalm nine, verse nine, as a stronghold in time of trouble. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in Psalm 18, verse one, God is described as the rock in whom I take refuge. Very appropriate. Very appropriate and timely. And Mm -hmm. you selected these particular verses to share about who God is well before this was happening. Yeah. Um, But here we are today. Let me back up and take that just for a second. I want to bring that full circle back to where I'm at as a missionary. You know, with your content in hand and talking about the situation in Um, Afghanistan and how that's spilling over to other parts of the world as um, people are fleeing. Mm -hmm. Can you describe how God is a refuge for people? Wow. Well, let me, let me thinking about right now with the present news, if the president's not president precedents, if the precedents has now been established that an one single American life isn't worth the expense. As a missionary in a foreign country, now granted, Germany is a first world country and many of the laws here are, are substantial and trustworthy. And so they take care of their people and we don't fear. We don't fear here at all. But what if tomorrow the German government collapses and we're here. What is my wife and my 16 year old daughter and myself, what do we do if we know that our government won't get us out? So traditionally in the old times, old times, now I'm starting to sound like it was a long time ago, (laughs) but traditionally, if, if something chaotic happened here where American lives were threatened, the first thing the Americans are taught or told to do is grab your passport and hightail it to the embassy, hightail it to any government institution that has an American presence, but mainly um, your consulate or the embassy. Once you get to the embassy, you get to the consulate, then as an American citizen, you're on American soil. That, That embassy is considered a part of the United States. And so you're safe and you're gonna be okay until they can get you out. Well, now with this news, all of a sudden we're like, okay, then we don't mean anything anymore now. Tax paying, voting citizen doesn't mean anything anymore. So what does Jesus being my rock, being my shepherd, being my stronghold mean? (laughs) Well, it's going to mean, okay, when the rubber hits the road and we find ourselves in the same situation as these Americans in Afghanistan, all I'm going to have is my maybe a, a little bit of the YouTube training that I picked up from here and there. <laughs> but the reality is I am going to be utterly dependent upon those who are around me. But if we're by ourselves, utterly dependent upon my faith and God getting us out of that situation. And I have to, as a missionary, be okay with if God doesn't rescue me the way I think he will rescue me. And say he allows my life to go the way of a martyr, then I need to be okay with that. I needed to be okay with that when we signed the papers to come over as missionaries. And so that had to be something we were ready to do. And that's what it's all about. So for me particularly, it just tells me my faith has got to be strong. So I'm hoping, 
I'm hoping that's going to be the case for those who are, watch, are watching us and listening to us today. I'm hoping that they will, most of us are, are really comfortable. We are, I just sat with one tonight. He's been over here for 30 years. And, um, you know, we, we are, I, I, when I say comfortable, I don't mean we're easy and we're taking a vacation. I'm just saying we don't feel threatened. We don't feel, be able to make the same decision because when it, when it comes down to it, that's all that matters is your faith. And I've got to believe that he's my rock. I've got to believe that he's my shepherd. I've got to believe that he's my safe refuge. Hey guys, it's Hollis. Are you a busy family, a busy parent, a busy professional, or a busy student? Are you looking to meet God in a new way? Do you want to renew your relationship with God or move from religion into relationship? Are you intimidated to do a formal Bible study? Intimidated to go into a church or have you been hurt in the church but still long for a relationship with God? Or maybe you're simply curious about God and the Bible but have no idea where to begin. Well, the Oh My God is Awesome membership is the weekly way to gain bite-sized biblical wisdom about the character of God so you can grow closer in relationship. To get more information about our monthly subscription membership, go to ohmygodisawesome.com. As a missionary, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm making a guess. Do you feel like you're part of a community of missionaries, even though you serve different organizations? And what oh, yeah. is the chatter and the the feeling and the sense that is happening within that specific community of missionaries christian missionaries american christian missionaries overseas right now we don't feel anxious if anything i think we feel super anxious regarding what's happening in the united states from this vantage point from across the pond i mean it seems like the united states is coming apart at the seams and we don't it, it's crazy at least that's what the news portrays. that doesn't mean it is it just it's what we see or hear, but overall, I think all of my colleagues here, and, and we're talking about Presbyterians, Baptists, Lutherans, Catholics, chaplains, Assemblies of God, all kinds of denominations and backgrounds. I think overall, we all feel that, you know, we're getting closer to Jesus's return. There, there is something in the air that's taking place and, and we need to, it's time, it's time to start helping people understand what their faith is all about and bringing them back, bringing them back to the center. In fact, this Sunday, we're starting a series on, on 16 fundamental truths found in scripture. And we're starting this series and it's my hope that our people will be able to grab a hold of these and, and know why they believe. Yes. Knowing not just believing, but why you believe what you believe. And so I would love are you able to promote that so that people who are watching this recording yeah, are yeah. able to maybe plug into your sermon series that's coming you up? How betcha. can they find you? You betcha. It, we're on Facebook right now. We're on, we're on two different platforms, Facebook, obviously, and then we're on uh, sermon.net. But the name of our church is True Life KMC. That's important to put the KMC in there because that stands for Kaiser Slautern Military, Re sorry, almost said Resiliency Center, <laughs> Kaiser Slautern Military Community. And so make sure you put in True Life KMC. And so we're on Facebook and it's an open, open page. So that just allows everybody to be able to view it. And then of course, like I said, sermon.net, same thing. You can view us there. And so as a pastor, what suggestions or advice would you give to people who are not strongly rooted in their faith, who have fallen away from, the, from, from their faith and or are feeling compelled to now seek out, you know, Jesus or God because things are so crazy and they just don't know where to turn? What kind of baby steps would you suggest? Mm, wow, that's a good one. That's a good one. You know, 
I think it's safe to say that going to your word, you know, the Bible, whatever, whatever that looks like, you know, if you, if you're a King James person or an NIV person or whatever, going back to the word of God is, is gotta be principally one of the most important things you can do because in the word is where we find our truth. We know that scripture tells us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That doesn't mean we necessarily put our ear to it. You can listen to it. It's not a problem. But the hearing there has everything to do with your heart responding to the truth of God. So getting back into your word and and honestly, you know, the word's kind of hard to read sometimes and that's okay. But the cool part about it is we find out in Timothy that it says that the word of God is active and alive and sharper than any two-edged sword. And it's meant to examine us. It's meant to challenge us. It's meant to expose sin. It's meant to expose bad character so that we can bring it all back to God. So I would say, get back in your Bible. And I would start, I would start in a book like John or a book like Romans. I wouldn't go to Leviticus. Leviticus is nice, but it's not for your Sunday afternoon reading because it's pretty detailed and it gets into a lot of stuff that you probably are like, ah, where does that come from? So get in. If you want to find out about Jesus, start in John, start in Romans, start in Mark or Luke, and that'll give you a reference point. Now, on top of that, I would do what the disciples did. And, and they came to Jesus and they said, hey, you know, we don't know how to pray. Can you teach us how to pray? And Jesus used a very simple formula, very simple. He said, this is how you should pray. And now we know it as the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer really gives us, it, it's fascinating. You can, you can repeat it. You can memorize it and repeat it if you want to. But the way I, I, I use it is, is it's a outline. So when it starts off with our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Okay, I have to stop there. And I need to think about how exalted is God? How amazing is he? Have I paid him any attention? Have I given notice to anything great that he's done in my life? Have I given him praise for what he's, what he's accomplished? That's what you're talking about is our father who's in heaven. Man, look how amazing he is. So then he goes, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Then it says, thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it already has been done in heaven. So Lord, let your kingdom come and let your will, not mine, your will be done right here in this world, my world, me, my heart, my mind, as it already has been done in heaven. And then, of course, it goes on, give us our bread, you know, da, 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 give us our daily. Uh, and so as it breaks down, I take it and then I just use that as an outline. And it helps me to have a focus for my prayer. It helps me to have targets of subject matter that I can bring to him. And especially when you get to the end, forgive us our trespasses. Yeah. So can you continue just to break that down section by section for us? Because I feel like you've set yeah. that up so so nicely. Okay. I just got to write. I got to no, try to remember it. I know. And I've heard that before <laughs> yeah. to use it as an outline, but I haven't done that myself. So thank you for kicking us off. Yeah. And if yeah. you can come. So it will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Yeah. So working give in us, our own selves, working in yep. our minds, and then give us our uh, daily bread. Yep. Give us our daily bread and then forgive us of our trespasses. So daily um, and, bread doesn't necessarily, it means meeting my needs in, yeah, in meet tangibly, my needs, Lord. I'm dependent but also spiritually, upon you. mentally. Yes. yes. I am dependent upon you to change my mind. I'm dependent upon you to change my heart. I'm dependent upon on you to supply my needs. I'm dependent upon you to take care of my family. Lord, I'm just putting all these needs to you because it, it's him that gives, you know, too many times we can get caught up in the things we got to pursue and we forget about the normal things that we really need that help us in our faith. So give us our, our, our bread, our daily bread, um, forgive us our trespasses. That's another key one. The beginning of bitterness, the beginning of hatred starts with an offense. So there's a progression. I get offended. And then when that offense is allowed to sit in my life and grow, it becomes a wound. It becomes, it, it becomes a place of bitterness and, and hurt. And then eventually it turns into what we refer to as hatred. And hatred in its, in its core is, is literally when you look at someone, you're hoping that where they are, the space they occupy turns into a black hole. So you're hoping that they're non-existent. They just disappear, that you don't want them in your life. That's where, that's where hatred comes. So 
you, people don't naturally get up in the morning and go, oh, you know what? I hate that person. No, that's not how it works. We had to be offended somewhere. So when we're talking about forgiving our trespasses, okay? So Lord, forgive my trespasses first and then forgive those who've trespassed against me. That This is an important thing because Jesus talks about, you know, when you're walking around, we used to have a skit we'd do when we were in, in, in youth group. <laughs> we'd have a guy that would come out and he'd have this paper mache log hanging out of his face. And then he would go over and talk to the guy who had a tiny, tiny, tiny little piece of a toothpick right here on his eye. And so he would tell him about all his problems. You know, you're this, this, this. And he never saw the thing coming out of his face. What was the point? Too many times we're pointing fingers at people and we're upset by what they do. And we don't even pay any attention to what we're doing. And so we get upset when someone hurts us. But how many times have we hurt others? So it's very important for us to make sure that we're having our trespasses forgiven and that those who've trespassed against us. And I love that word trespass because it is, it is so, it, it's so blatant. It's so out front. We don't use it in our wordage today, obviously, but when you and I come to a fence of property that a person owns on their fence, it says no trespassing. That means when I cross over that fence, I have crossed over into that person's public and not public, private life, their personal space. I have invaded somewhere that I shouldn't invade. So when I trespass against somebody, I've come into their world and have done something that hurt them. So that's how we do that. We got to forgive. We got to forgive. And, and let me just throw this out there since everybody's watching and I hopefully this doesn't take too much long, but longer forgiveness is, is connected to emotion. And, and we have to understand that it's also connected to faith. So when we forgive someone, we may not feel like we have forgiven them. That's okay. Continue to forgive them until you're not forgiving them anymore. And I know that sounds strange, but I put it this way. It, 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 it gets, it comes to the place where I have to lay this thing down at Jesus's feet and I keep laying it down until it becomes harder for me to pick it up than it was to lay it down. And so, you know, you may, someone may have hurt you. They may have, you know, raped your daughter, God forbid, or stole your car or slapped you in the face or robbed you of, of uh, a few hundred dollars or what, what have you. It doesn't matter what it is. And you say, Jesus, I forgive them. But inside you're raging and you're like, wait, they, they shouldn't be able to get away with this. Jesus, I forgive them. Jesus, I forgive them. Jesus, I forgive them. And you keep going there and you keep going there and you keep going there until what happens is you start becoming compassionate with that person. And all of a sudden, the next thing you know, you're lifting them up, asking for God to move in their life and to bless them and forgive them. That mm. that's powerful. That's powerful. Yeah, that really is. So, you know, and, and listen, there's never a degree on sin. Sin is sin is sin is sin. And, and yet wounds can have differing levels. And we know that I knew a young lady who had been molested by loved by an uncle or, or something like that. I can't remember for sure, but you know, I told her, I said, you know, imagine, you know, what, what you went through was hard. That was hard and it was not fair. And yeah, he deserves to be string, strung up. If I was left to myself and didn't have Jesus in my life, yeah, you know, that's probably where we need to go. But the reality is, is if you don't forgive this person, you will carry that. And what will happen is you'll end up becoming a sore spot to someone else and you'll never be free. You'll be a prisoner of that thing. It doesn't mean you forget it. it doesn't mean you let it go. It doesn't mean you don't trust people anymore. No, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, you let that person who hurt you go because all you're going to do is carry around that weight and it, mm -hmm. it's painful. It's painful. Well, so, okay. No, and ahead. real Sorry. quick, I just, I had a thought too. I've heard, you know, the phrase that hanging on to unforgiveness is like taking, swallowing a poison pill and expecting the other person to yep. die. It will eventually yep. kill you. Yep. But yes. So yes, let's keep walking through um, the Lord's prayer. So yeah, uh, forgive us our trespasses can... as those who have trespassed against us and lead us not into temptation. Yes, there you go. 
there you go. Lead us not into temptation. This is an important one. God isn't the one who leads us there. God doesn't take you by the hand and go, let's go to temptation. He, yeah, he doesn't do that. The enemy, the, the perspective there or the purpose of that particular phrase is, Lord, let me not be led into temptation. So, Lord, I'm, I'm asking that you help me to avoid temptation. And, man, temptation happens to everybody. I've been in ministry for over 30 years. I, I, I still, I told our church on Sunday, I said, look, I still have the thoughts. I still have the ideas. I still have the crazy things that come to mind, but it depends on whether you act on it or not. And the book of James tells us that when you're tempted, you, you see, you, you sin, you sin when you act on the thought. So the thought comes, that's the, where the temptation lies, and then you act on it. When you act on it, that gives birth to sin. Then sin, if left unchecked, give, gives birth to death. So the death can be both physical, spiritual, but it also could be emotional. So mm -hmm. we need to understand that just because the thought comes in doesn't mean you're a sinner. It's when you step out and act on that thought. So for a man, if it's, uh, if it's a, a temptation for lust, and, and sadly, I don't know why God designed this this way, but for men, we're visually stimulated. That's what I've said. And whenever I've done marriage, <laughs> whenever I've done premarital counseling, I, I, I tell the woman, I tell the man, listen, all you have to do, wife, is walk in the door. You could walk in the door in overalls. You could walk in the door in a trash bag. You could walk in the door on your head. You can walk in the door backwards. You could walk in the door with one eye, whatever. But you come in the door. All that man has to do is see you and be ready to go. Now, for you, on the other hand, you're like an old World War II air raid siren. And you got to wind it and wind it. And, wind. and the man has to spend all day long just to get you ready. And then once you're ready, you can't turn you off. But for him, it's on, off, on, off, on, off all day long. So he has to constantly be aware when he comes into any situation how dangerous a thought is, just how quick it happens, and to not act on it. So ladies, don't get surprised if your husband struggles with that. But you got to just, you got to pray for him. And you got to give him a reason to come home at night. That's a big, 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 big thing. So that's important. So we'll leave that there before we get off our tangent. So, and then deliver us from evil. Yes. Deliver us from evil. That's it comes right back to that same thing. Lord, just, just help me to be aware, help me to be aware, to not, not do things that don't please you because the root word, the, the Greek and the Hebrew for the word evil is the absence of God. God, keep me from doing anything where you're not there. Help me to always do everything, whether it's a thought or an action or, vo or voicing something or what have you. Help me to do stuff where you are always pleased and you are always present. Because when I do stuff, then you're not there. That gets me in trouble. And so what was the last one? Um, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Yeah, there you go. There you go. That's mm -hmm. yeah, what a way to end. So you mm -hmm. end the way you started. You're giving him all the glory. You're giving him all the praise. You're giving him all the attention because that's where he is. That's where he lives. And so that just helps us to keep our center in him and not ourselves. Well, and I think I love, thank you for outlining that with examples, because what we do then is take that roadmap of the Lord's prayer, which many of us, I mean, myself included, not growing up in the church, but I learned the Lord's prayer in my private school. We said it every yeah. day. And, yeah. and so it's just, it's been ingrained in my head, but using that as a roadmap, inserting our own items and yeah. things from our lives to glorify yeah. God, to improve our relationships with others and improve our relationship with him. And then again, turn Absolutely. back, turn that back to him. So I, I hope yeah. that people will take some notes on that and, and implement that for themselves. So, yeah. So Paul, as we are wrapping up here, I wanted to um, say thank you for just sharing what's happening in your life, in your ministry, in Germany, at the military base with the evacuees. And of course, Amen. pointing out to God or pointing out to us where God is at work in all of this. So I just wanted to offer you the opportunity for any final thoughts or any requests that you have for people who are watching or listening. The only thing I can really say is this. 
don't quit. You know, I use this reference. I'm a baseball fan. Babe Ruth hit 70 home runs. One of the first ones to ever do it. In fact, he was the first one to do it, I believe. But he did it while also having 700 strikeouts. And we only fail when we quit. And I look at Hebrews. And Hebrews 11 talks about faith. But Hebrews 12 says, let us run the race that's marked out for us. Jesus never asked you to run at a certain speed. And he never asked you to do anything more than just be faithful. And sometimes faithfulness is not quitting. It's not being perfect. It's just not quitting. So every time you think that God's abandoned you, every time you feel like you want to give up, don't give up because God hasn't given up on you. He's your biggest fan. And I'll end with this. Why in the world would God give up on you after paying for you with such a high, high price. I know one thing for me, if I ever make a purchase that costs me one of my children, whatever it is that I bought, I'm definitely not going to give up on very easily. So just imagine that God is not going to give up on you because he gave his son for you. Amen. Wow. That's really powerful. Well, thank you again, Paul, and I appreciate everyone that tuned in for um, this kind of special episode interview. Thank you for listening to the Oh My God Pod with Hollis Moore and Lori Spiker. We want you to know that God desires a relationship with you, just like a trusted friend. Our desire for you is to find hope, inspiration and connection through today's story. And we hope that you will experience God in your own unique way too. Stay connected and share your stories by joining our Facebook group, visiting our website, ohmygodpod.com, and of course, subscribing to the podcast. And remember, Oh My God is awesome.